Welcome to the next reading from my simplified and abridged version of The Perfect Way. This reading, which is from the sixth lecture, concerns the fall. It is not without deep meaning and design that the book of Genesis opens with a description of the four rivers of paradise. For their names and attributes provide the four notches of the key to unlock all the mysteries of the scriptures to which Genesis serves as the prologue and argument. These mysteries are, like the rivers of Eden, distributed into four channels, each belonging to a distinct region of the fourfold human kingdom, whose queen and priestess is the soul. And one of the most precious and profound of these mystic scriptures is the drama of the fall, whose acts depicted in the initial chapters of the Bible serve as a series of hieroglyphic tableau to delineate at once the history of mankind and the purpose of religion. Let us now examine in the order indicated by the hieroglyphic symbol of the four rivers, the meanings of the mystic story to which it is prefixed. Taking first the meaning corresponding to the river Pishon, or the body, we have a representation of the condition of humanity in the perfect state, with special reference to the just and harmonious relations existing in that state between the body and the soul. This perfect condition is exemplified by a picture of the first mystic community, lodge, or church of man formed in the image of God, who, under the name of sons of God, were set apart from mere rudimentary men not made in the divine image. That is the still materialistic part of mankind. This perfect condition was and still is reached collectively and individually by a process of evolution or, grandu or gradual unfoldment and growth from the lowest to highest. Those who first attained this perfect state are celebrated by Ovid and others as the people of the golden age or primal Sabbath of the world under Saturn. This age is reached either individually or collectively whenever the divine spirit working within has completed the generation of man, making him spiritually in the image of God male and female. Such is the Son of God having power, because in him the soul dominates the body, and the body has no will of its own apart from that of the divine spirit. In this aspect of the parable, Adam represents the bodily or sensuous nature in man and his wife represents his psychical and spiritual nature. The descriptive term translated help, helper, or helpmeet, that is applied to the woman, signifies an overseeing guide, and the name Isha, by which she is at first designated, denotes the generative substance or feminine principle of humanity. After the fall, she is Chava, or Eve, a term denoting the circle of life and represented by a serpent. As the soul, she has two aspects, the earthly and the heavenly, and is indicated, therefore, by two kinds of serpent, the serpent of the dust, or tempter, and the serpent who rep which represents the divine wisdom, or Sophia, in which aspect she is man's initiator into divine knowledge. This heavenly serpent, the representative of the solar ray, as opposed to the, the serpent of the subterranean fire, is familiar to us under the name of seraph, the title given to angels of the highest order in the celestial hierarchy and signifying the burning, that is, sons of the sun. 
In Egyptian symbology, the divine seraph or serpent appears constantly surmounting a cross and wearing the crown of Maut, the mother. That is the living mother who is the, the original and who is the original and celestial reason. This is the serpent on the cross, by looking to which another sacred parable tells us, the Israelites were healed of the venomous bites inflicted on them by the serpent of the dust, the earthly and destructive reason whose figure is derived not from the life-giving sun ray, but from the flame of the devouring and rapacious fire. And thus it is said in the gospel that by the exhibition of this divine wisdom, by the restoration of the woman or mother of the living to her rightful throne, will the world finally be redeemed from the dominion of the serpent of the abbess, that is, of the lower and materialistic reason. For as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For Christ is identical with Amun-Ra, our Lord the Son, offspring of the heavenly mount, and the means of delivering mankind from the ravenous lion and the fiery serpents of the outer intellect or earthly wilderness of sin will be the exaltation of the dual humanity, which is at one and the same time mother and son. In the individual or microcosmic system, the celestial wisdom or soul of the universe finds expression as the soul of the man. And the condition of humanity unfallen and sinless is one of obedience on the part of the sense nature or Adam to the rule of the soul or Eve. But this state of things is directly reversed by the fall and the woman or the living becomes subject to the sense nature. This is the curse and the curse will be removed, paradise regained and the second Sabbath of the golden age achieved only when this woman is given back her rightful supremacy. Eve is said to be taken from the side of the sleeping Adam because, although the soul is in all persons, she becomes revealed only in those who have transcended the consciousness of the body. When the Adam is asleep, passive, unassertive, the soul or living man is made manifest. And the soul's function is to guide, to rule, to command. And her vocation is that of the seer, the priestess, the interpreter and guardian of the mysteries. Tokens of the superior respect once accorded to the soul and to woman as the soul's representative abound in the historical remains of Egypt, where, as we learn from countless sculptures, writings and paintings, the goddess Isis held rank above her husband. The chief instructor in the mysteries was represented as a woman. Priestly and noble families traced their pedigree through the female line, and public acts and chronicles were dated by the name of the high priestess of the year. Such then are the mutual relations between Adam and Eve sense nature and soul in the Edenic or unfallen state. And the parable describes the end of the Edenic Sabbath, the ruin of the golden age, the fall of the church as brought about by, the, by disobedience to the divine voice or central spirit to which the soul ought to be dutiful at all times. Sin thus originates with the soul as the responsible part of man, and she whose office is to be his overseer and guide becomes his betrayer. 
The forbidden fruit communicated by the soul to Adam is the vital flame or consciousness, described by the classical poets as the fire of heaven. For as God is supreme and original consciousness, the first manifestation of human consciousness has its seat in the soul. In the pure Edenic state, or as it is called, the state of innocence, Therefore, the shrine of this heavenly fire is in the spiritual part of man. But Prometheus, or pseudo-thought, the false thought as opposed to the true hermetic reason, steals or draws down this fire from its original place and transfers it to the outer man or body. From then onwards, the consciousness of man ceases to ride in the, reside in the soul and becomes centered in the body. This is to say that man in his fallen condition is conscious only of the personal identity of the body. And until regenerate or redeemed from the fall, he does not again become conscious and vitalized in the soul. To find the soul is the first step towards finding Christ. That is, as the Catholic Church puts it, Mary brings us to Jesus. The materialistic, unregenerate man is totally unconscious of his soul. He is aware only of the body, and his perception of life is limited to the bodily sense. It is through the transference of the vitalizing fire from the heaven to the earth of the human system that the lower nature is inflamed and starts warring with the divine spirit or Zeus within the man. This act is the Promethean theft, which is punished so terribly by the father at the hand of Hermes, the true thought or angel of understanding since on account of it, man becomes bound and chained to the things of sense, the victim of a perverse will, which, like an insatiable bird of prey, continually rends and, rends and devours him. Thus is formulated the condition which Paul so graphically laments. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. But I see another law in my body, warring against the law in my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my body. O wretched man, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Although sin originates in the soul, the bodily nature is the ultimate offender. So it is Adam who is asked, Have you eaten from the tree I ordered you not to eat from? And the penalty pronounced on Adam enumerates the sorrows of the body in its fallen state and foretells its inevitable return to the dust and earth from which it came. This penal penalty differs from the one incurred by Eve, whose will, ceasing to direct itself inwards and upwards to her divine center, is now, on account of the fall, projected outwards and downwards towards her earthly mate. Like Lot's wife in another and related parable, she looks back and straightway becomes a pillar of salt. Salt in the terminology of the alchemists was a syn synonym for matter. This transformation into salt is the converse of the great work, that is, the fixation of the volatile. The great work in alchemy is the volatilization of the fixed. By this act of ceasing to align herself with the spirit, that is, that is, by the fixation of the volatile, the soul imprisons herself definitively in the body and becomes subject to it until the redemption, for which Paul says all creation groans and travails in the pain of desire. 
In this, the first of the four explanations of our parable, the tree of life is the secret of transmutation or of eternal life, which it is impossible for the rebellious Adam to partake of. This is because the fruit of this tree is unattainable while the elements of disorder remain in the body, while the flesh lusts against the spirit, while the microcosm tolerates two diverse wills and is swayed by two adverse laws. If it were possible for this ruined and disobedient Adam to eat and live forever, that eternal life would necessarily be the eternal hell of the Calvinists, that endless condition of torment and defiance of God that life indestructible in the midst of destruction, which would, were it possible, constitute the division of the universe and set up in opposition to the divine rule an equivalent and equally eternal throne of devil rule. As in this reading of the myth, Adam represents the person, Eve, the soul, and the divine voice, the spirit, so the serpent typifies the astral element or lower reason. For this, for this subtle element is the intermediary between soul and body, the fiery serpent, whose food is the dust, that is, the perception of the senses, which are concerned with the things of time and matter only. This serpent, if not controlled and dominated by the will of the initiate, leads the soul into bondage and perdition. By destroying the equilibrium of the system and dividing the hearth fire. But though when not kept in check, the astral fire becomes, through its function of tempter, the destroyer and agent of negation, it is also when under the dominion of the married spirit and soul, an element of power and a glass of vision. The removal from her rightful place of the living mother, Isha, Chava, or Eve, typified by the celestial serpent, is then brought about by the, by the seductions of the earthly and astral serpent. From this arises the ruin of the Edenic order. The soul becomes subject to the body, intuition to the sense nature, the inner to the outer, the higher to the lower. From this time onwards, the warnings of the soul must be suppressed, her aspirations crushed, her conceptions difficult, and her giving birth full of sorrow. Intuition wars with passion, and every victory of the spiritual man is bought with anguish. And between the Kabbalistic woman and the astral serpent, there must be perpetual enmity, for from here onwards the astral is antagonistic to the psychical, and between the intellectual and the intuitional, a great gulf is fixed. For this astral serpent is the earthly fire, and the Kabbalistic woman is the water, the Maria, which, which is destined to quench it. She shall crush his head, and he shall lie in wait for her heel. Such on the historical plane of the individual or of the church is the meaning of paradise and its loss the gradual attainment of a certain high grade and the falling away from it. And the immediate effects of such a loss manifest themselves in a subversion of the divine natural order and in the supremacy of the outer over the inner, of the lower over the higher. Humanity in paradise, made in the divine image and unfallen, was given the tree, the tree fruits, and the herb grains as food. At the time, as Ovid tells us, men were contented with the food which nature freely bestowed. 
for the bodily appetites knew no law except that of a healthy natural intuition and obeyed the impulse of the God within, desiring no other nourishment than that for which alone the body was anatomically and physiologically designed. But as soon as it acquired a perverse, selfish will, a new lust arose because a new and subhuman nature appeared in it, the nature of the beast of prey, whose image is the fallen, whose image the fallen body has put on. All the poets, all the seers, all the regenerate testify that this is literal truth. And likewise, they bear witness that paradise can never be regained, that regeneration can never be completed, that man can never be fully redeemed until the body is brought under the law of Eden and has cleansed itself thoroughly from the stain of blood. No one will ever know the joys of paradise who cannot live like dwellers in paradise. No one will ever help to restore the golden age to the world who does not first restore it in himself. No one who sheds blood or eats flesh ever touched the central secret of things or took a firm hold on the tree of life. Hence it is written of the holy city without our dogs. For the foot of the carnivorous beast cannot tread the golden floors, and lips polluted with blood may not pronounce the divine name. A truer word than this was never spoken, and if we should speak no other, we should say that all man needs to know, we should say all, and if we should speak no other, we should say all that man needs to know. For if he will only live the life of Eden, he shall find all its joys and its mysteries within his grasp. He who will do the will of God shall know the doctrine. But until father and mother are forsaken, that is, until the disciple is resolved to let no earthly affections or desires withhold him from entering the perfect way, Christ will not be found nor paradise regained. Many indeed begin the rites, says Plato, but few are fully purified. And a greater than Plato has warned us that the way is straight and the gate narrow that leads unto life, and few there are who find it. Well, that concludes my second series of reading, which I hope you enjoyed, and I look forward to the third and final set in the not-too-distant future. So thank you for listening.